Hi, everyone, and welcome to Recovery Out Loud. I'm Noelle Carmen, and today we are talking about what we can do as parents and loved ones of teens to steer them away from drugs um, and possible addiction. With us today, we have Andrea Baskin. She is the Clinical Director for Safe Landing. It is a treatment center for teens struggling with addiction. Andrea, thank you so much, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit first about Safe Landing, um, where it is, and what kind of help you guys offer teens. So we are a substance abuse facility. We are located in Miami, Florida. We offer dual diagnosis, so we treat primarily substance abuse, but we know that most teens that come into the facility will have other underlying um, issues, so such as depression, anxiety, bipolar, PTSD, a history of trauma, you know, anything like that we can treat. So if they have been struggling with any type of substance use, we can definitely you know, treat them, bring them on, and then treat those underlying issues that are contributing possibly to the substance use. So let me ask you, because you're on the front line of teens and what the landscape looks like now for substance abuse with regards to teens. So can you kind of paint a picture as to what that looks like for for parents, for um, people like me, I have five kids, I have no idea what that looks like. So right now we're seeing a lot of, and even you know, if we talk about the pandemic, we're seeing increased substance use as a result of many different reasons, one of them being isolation. So now kids don't have the ability to do go out and do things and experience joy overall as they were before. Um, they find themselves isolating at home where they can't really, you know, talk to others and just, you know, over virtual platforms, which is not the same. So they find themselves using a lot more, you know, it could be from marijuana to Xanax to pills, you know, it could be whatever drug of choice they're probably using and that makes it or they might have to fight it every time. That we have kind of increased um, exponentially due to what's been going on over the past, I would say, eight months now. So are you seeing this, um, you, you do the pandemic, are you seeing um, families much more stressed now with regards to just their own relationships, let alone the drug usage. Yes, and one of the things that I have found is that since parents started working from home, they started noticing more of the drug use. So before, you know, adolescents and kids were going to school, they were seeing their friends, you know, they were out of the house by doing their extracurricular activities and parents were not necessarily as aware that this was going on. Now that they spent a lot of time at home and realized, okay, something's off, something's going on. They're irritable, they're upset all the time. They're sleeping a lot. You know, they don't want to be part of the family activities. Like now, parents have been able to be more present um, and know that there's a possible issue going on that has to be addressed. So I would say that's been the biggest change with parents. And you know, the parents have been stressed because of everything that's been going on, and this has definitely added to that. So tell us about what parents can do. So now all of a sudden, the pandemic in a way is a good thing because it's forced us to kind of reconnect with our families in maybe a way that we've been disconnected. And we as parents stop and look around and go, oh my gosh, what has been happening right under my nose that I was not aware of? What do you say initially? Because I can imagine initially that's panic, right? Everything's out of control. Like, can you kind of talk us through that as parents, as loved ones, guardians of teens? So, and just to rephrase uh, what you're saying, is it what they can do to, to once they find out they're, they're, they're using? Yes, there's now this reconnection um, and realizing, as you mentioned, that there is trouble that where they didn't see it before, um, that initial panic um, of, you know, wanting to gain control, but realizing things are out of control, maybe. So the first thing that I suggest is reach out to a professional, reach out to a counselor in your area. Right now, one of the good things about the pandemic has been the ability to you know, get resources in an in easier way, being able to hop on and find a therapist, find um, you know a clinician, just find a psychiatrist that can see you know, and have appointments available way sooner than they would in the past. So that's the first thing I would recommend is reach out to someone that's um, a professional in this field and who is able to guide you through what to do. Because yes, the first reaction is panic. 
what am I going to do? This is happening. I need to fix it now. Um, and, and that's okay because that's, that's a natural, but it has to be um, definitely a proactive rather than a reactive kind of thing where we're able to see what are the steps that need to be taken because it's going to be a process. It's not going to be something that's going to be right away. We're going to put a bandaid on it and we're going to fix it. It's going to be now, what do we have to do as a family, as a whole, you know, system to be able to help because there's obviously something going on with this adolescent, but there's also going on some something going on probably within the family system. So it's reaching out to someone who's able to guide um, guide the family through what are the next steps that need to be taken to be able to assess and see how bad this is. So in so taking it from a parental point of view, um, and and being now confronted with this, what are the things not to do? For example, probably um, running in and confronting your teen in maybe a more aggressive way is probably not the thing to do. Can you talk us through things we might be inclined um, to do in a reactionary way that probably we should step back and say, okay, this might make things worse. Yes. Definitely yelling. Yelling would be, and that's what that would might be a lot of parents' reaction. Like, what are you doing? What do you mean you're into this? Like, what's going on out of desperation and worry? So there could be that component. No, you know, I would advise against screaming. Maybe even confronting them at the beginning. I would um, advise them to really seek help before even confronting them. If we know that it's they're using to a life and death component, then I would find me, and I can talk a little bit about that, like what to do if you find that they are in immediate danger at that moment. Um, if they are not in immediate danger, it's about being able to kind of take the steps. So stepping away from, you know, screaming, confronting, blaming, you know, causing, you know, uh, blaming each other. Parents might find themselves blaming their partner. It's because you did this, because, you know, they're doing this because of you, because you yelled at them. So avoiding that, because at this moment is about, you know, staying together and being able to find a solution and the right process to be able to, you know, help the teen. And none of that will help. We know that screaming, cursing, hitting, none of those things will be helpful to the teen. It's only going to make them feel more defensive, yell back, you know, get into a, a moment where they could even put themselves in danger because they could say, you know what, I'm good, just going to go. I'm going to go over my friend's house. And then out of feeling desperate and feeling upset, end up using more and putting themselves in a really dangerous situation. So I would say, take a deep breath, take a step back and really think this with, you know, with, you know, your rational head, not with the emotional component, just with the rational, which is hard because it's a very emotional, yes. it's in a very emotional situation, very stressful, yeah. very fear invoking. So there, there's a lot of that, but I would suggest that main thing is to take a deep breath and step back. You know, I want to talk about something you just mentioned, which is blame, which, um, you know, happens automatically. As soon as stress presents itself, here we go blaming ourselves as parents for the circumstance. Um, and I'm sure that not only plays an initial part of the reaction, but also is something on a longer term that needs to be um, addressed. So can you speak about that and really um, how parents can step back in a healthy way from blame to um, create a more healthy environment for their family, for the recovery of their teens. Right. So I would suggest, you know, in, in this situation, blaming anyone is not going to help anything. So it's staying away from saying it's your fault or, you know, it's your friends or it's this, uh, you know, it's, it's what we did or it's what someone did. It's taking that component out because, you know, obviously when parents go through this, they want to find something, they want to find a reason why. Why are they using Is it because they are hanging out with this girlfriend or this boyfriend or friends? What's going on? What do I need to take away so that it doesn't affect my child anymore? And the truth is we got to start with that. You know, the, all those things might be contributing and they might, the, the peer pressure might have something to do with it and all of that, but it has to be within them. You know, we're not going to, if we take away everything for an environment, it's not going to necessarily change their behavior. So it's about being able to, as, as parents, unite, be a united front and be able to confront this together, you know, as a family. And then taking away the excuses and the, the blame to other things is seeing like we have a problem. He's using because of a reason. What's going on? Could it be? you know, co-occurring disorders, um, could it be, you know, just exploration, could it be because they thought it was just fun and it's getting out of hand. It could be a lot of reasons, but it's kind of getting to that without pointing the finger. Because if we also, if we point the finger, we might be missing out on what's really happening. If I say, 
you know, they're using because of their girlfriend or their boyfriend. And if I take the boyfriend away, then everything's going to be okay. That might not be the reality. The reality is we might take away the boyfriend and they might continue to still use. So it's really being able to get that and be able to um, kind of be able to see it from their perspective. Sorry. Um, what about, you also mentioned addiction versus say exploration. Um, a parent might jump to the conclusion that, oh my gosh, my kid is now an addict. Where, like, how do how do parents sort through that to know? Okay, this is this might be something just in terms of exploration, or oh my gosh, we have a real we have a real substance use issue on our hands. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is once you find out that they're using, now you're gonna have to be monitoring all the time. Now this is telling you that they're using. Could they be using once a month for exploration? Could be the first time they try something? Maybe. Could it be now that they are starting to use it more and more? So it's really about being able to be, really get involved and be able to assess. I would take it, I always tell parents, take it very seriously. The moment that you see and you know that they have used something, even if they don't know that you're taking it seriously, you know, be very on top of it. Be you know, start monitoring behaviors. You start drug testing if you can. Start monitoring their food, their outings, everything you can monitor just to make sure you know, what could be um, you know, drug tests are a very good way to find out um, are they using, are they not using? Obviously, this would come probably after a conversation that's um, talked about with the team about what's going on and and worries, and hopefully, you know, if if things are escalating, bringing another professional on board that can assist with this, but definitely being able to be on top of it is the biggest thing. So let me ask you about um, escape and avoidant behavior. Do you mm -hmm. find in your experience that mainly um, teens are using because they don't know how to cope with emotions, they don't know how to cope with their life, and this is just the easy way, um, and then how does that play into actual addiction? Yes, so that, um, you know, that's a great question because we do find that. We find that teens who have gone through traumatic experiences, you know, I always tell the teens when I meet with them, I say, you know, I, you could not pay me enough to go back to, your, to be your age. It's a very difficult time where, you know, you have your homers, you have physical changes, you know, emotional changes, the environment, there's a lot of peer pressure, what you're supposed to look like, what you're supposed to be, that, you know, you have a sense of wanting to belong as well. So it's, it's really a tough, difficult, and they don't have the cognitive ability to really think about consequences and think about, you know, I'm really doing this. How is this going to affect me in the future? At the moment, they do it because it feels good. It's good right now. It's making me feel good right now. So I'm going to continue doing it. So I do see that when there is, and it's, I would say it's the same for adults. If you find yourself mm -hmm. that you are sad, depressed, anxious, and you find something and you had a drink and all of a sudden you feel better, that reinforces that behavior. It reinforces the fact that you want to drink more because it has helped to cope, to cope with that anxiety and that depression or those feelings that are, you know, feelings from past trauma whatever it is that makes you feel uncomfortable so it applies to the teens as well you know they find they they know they don't feel great they might not know yeah. why but then somebody introduces them you know smoke this you'll milk you it will make you feel better and at that point i say you know what it did so why not smoke it again and that's how it continues to and all of a sudden you know they don't since they don't have the cognitive ability to think about the consequences mm -hmm. now they're addicted now they created a dependence mm -hmm. where you know, they need to use it all the time because if not, they're going to feel anxious. Now mm -hmm. they're going to have withdrawal symptoms. Now they don't want to feel that anxiety. So they don't want to feel any of those negative feelings because why would they if they found something that's making them feel good? What if you're a parent who suspects you don't know, but you suspect something's going on? What should be looked for in terms of clues and signs that there is something happening? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I always say any changes in behavior that you were seeing. So changes in behavior could be now they, they're sleeping more, they're sleeping less. You know, now they are not wanting to be as involved with the family as they were before. Um, extracurricular activities, now they no longer want to participate when they were very into their sports. Um, school, grades are dropping. You know, we see that's a big indicator. You start seeing they were always great students and now the grades are, you know, now they have really bad grades. What's going on? Nothing has really changed. So those are all signs, changes in appetite. Irritability is a big one. Now suddenly they're always 
they're yelling or they're irritable or everything is annoying, everything is upsetting. And not that they are a direct um, you know, indicator that they might be using, but they're a big indicator. You know, if, if they are not using and you're still seeing these behavior changes and you're still seeing all these things, then there might be something else to look at because there could be experiencing depression, anxiety, mental health issues that have not been addressed and that they might not even know what they are. Let's talk immediate danger. Um, we, now we're in crisis mode. Talk, talk us through that. Okay, so crisis mode, there's a teen that's telling their parents, I'm gonna hurt myself. I'm gonna hurt myself, I'm gonna hurt you. Um, you know, so anything of that nature. There is always, I always tell parents, the first thing you do is you call the police. The police will come out and the police will be able to assess. At that point, the, what is most likely to happen if they continue to verbalize that is they will get taken to a psychiatric unit. There's several, like around our area, there's several um, psychiatric uh, facilities that will take them for a hold of about 72 hours. It could be less, it could be a little more depending on the symptoms. After that, you know, the hospital will assess and see, you know, why did this happen? Is this something that's been occurring where this adolescent has been struggling with suicidal ideation? Because they might have been struggling with suicidal ideation for a while. This might be the first time they verbalize it. So I always say, take it seriously. Don't think, I hear from parents sometimes tell me, they're just saying that to get attention. Mm -hmm. Maybe, we don't know. It could be the other way around where now they're saying it because they actually meant it and they could end up hurting themselves. So I always say you take it for the seriousness of what, of what they're telling you that they could be about to hurt themselves or hurt someone else. So definitely calling the police, you know, it's not, it's not a crime. I tell them we're not calling the police because you're in trouble. We're calling the police because they are the ones that are coming in to support us. They are the ones that can help us. After that, the hospital will set will set up a, an aftercare plan where they will continue to see a therapist, or they might be if they're using, they might go into treatment. And if they're not using and they're severe psychiatric, they might have to look into a psychiatric facility that will be able to handle the psychiatric needs at that point. So that's what I suggest. Immediate need is definitely always calling the police and being able to, um, you know, put a sense of urgency to the situation. You know, I would like to address and perhaps debunk the idea. There's this notion in society of if you've got a problem, just stop. So how many parents have you encountered that go to their teens and say to a teen really struggling with substance use, you know, you, you need to make really good decisions. You need to stop this. You need to just quit, get back on track. And how defeating and demoralizing that can be truly for a teen struggling with addiction. Yes. Um, and that's something you know, I see. We make phone calls sometimes with the kids to the parents and I see them rolling their eyes because I'm like lecture time. That's what we call it. Because, you know, and, and it comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of caring. It comes from a place of wanting for them to make good choices. But the truth is, you know, when you're doing that, you're missing really what's going on with the teen. You're missing the ability to give them space for them to really be able to verbalize what's happening. You know, could they just stop? Maybe, maybe not. But what's underneath that? Why can't they stop? Why are they choosing not to stop? What are they getting from using that's so beneficial to them in their mind that they don't want to stop or even they can't. So this is when they come into treatment in an inpatient facility, I always tell them, this is what you're here because you're going to take a break. You're going to take a break from everything and kind of reassess things from a different perspective. It's very hard to reassess when they're out there using. Mm -hmm. They need to take a break and be able to say, and how many times do I hear, I really needed this because I needed to think with a clear head that I haven't had the chance to do that in the past, whatever long they've been using. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's really about getting to know the teen and getting to know What's inside that head? What's inside of them? What are they all about? Because they have so much in them, so much to say, so much to share. But sometimes they don't because they haven't felt the space to be able to do it. And that segues right beautifully into my next question is tell us about treatment. So I'm a mom, I'm watching this, um, but you know, it's a vulnerable thing to hand your kid over to a bunch of strangers, right? And so can you kind of, Talk us through what treatment looks like and how am I supposed to feel good about that as a parent? 
absolutely. I'm a parent too, so I would be, you know, I always tell the parents I'm a parent too, and I would never, you know, have a facility that I wouldn't send my kids to. And that's my biggest goal. You know, as a mom um, and, and a clinician and a clinical director, I want to make sure that we have a split place that's safe first of all safety is my priority i want to make sure that everyone is safe because that's why you know kids are coming in to be in a safe environment away from all the stressors that they have normally in their home outside of their home with their friends so making sure that that's the biggest goal after that you know being able to really one of our biggest things is having for the therapist to have low case loads because that gives us the ability for the therapist to really be involved with each parent and be really able to have the time to dedicate to questions, concerns, worries, anything that comes up, um, crises, interventions, anything that needs to be. So that's one of the biggest things that we do is making sure that the parents have a lot of communication with the team. They talk to our case managers, they talk to myself, they talk to the therapist, they talk to you know all the staff basically, and they're able to really know what's going on on a daily basis, you know, getting daily updates, hearing from them on a daily basis to know that I'm okay, you know, my day, my day was my day, or it was good, or it wasn't that good, but being able to know that they're okay. So those are all ways that we're able to provide the parents with some peace of mind to know that they're choosing a place where their children are safe. On the flip side of that, addressing parents who say, oh my gosh, take this problem off of my hands. This, can you please fix this kid and get back to us when the problem's solved? Also not seeing that the family system is actually, um, I don't know, would you say part of the problem or at least Absolutely. it participates in the addiction? Absolutely, that's the biggest thing. And one of the things that I tell the parents is we're, you're gonna have to be as involved as they are. You're going to have to be part of this process. We have at least two family sessions a week it's where they're going to have to show up. They're going to have to participate. And that's a big part. With the teens, and this is where the biggest difference between the teens and the adults come in, because if an adult goes to treatment, they can start over their life. They can choose, you know, they don't have to have necessarily involvement from their parents or, you know, or anyone in their life. They might too, but not. it might not be as necessary because the teens will go back to their parents. We'll go back to the same home environment. And if the home environment doesn't change, it's very unlikely that things will be done differently. So it really has to be a change all around. From the parents, one of the things that I encourage the parents to do is to get their own therapy. The reason for that is for them to be able to deal with their own past, their own present, the anxieties, and also knowing how to handle the situation. It's, I always say, it's a source of support where they'll be able to tell you, now they're coming home, now this is happening, what do I do? So they are, we prepare them for aftercare. We have coaching sessions. We, we talk to the parents. We do family sessions um, involving that. But also having someone, an outside person that they can go to that's kind of their, um, you know, their own therapist is also very helpful. What would you say to a parent who is stuck? Because I can imagine myself as a parent knowing there's a problem. How do you encourage families to have the courage to take that step uh, to move towards treatment when it is basically jumping into the abyss, jumping into this process, you really, really don't know what the outcome is going to be. So do, do you have a word of encouragement there mm -hmm. for parents? Um, you know, I, I tell them to really that this is, this is preventative mm -hmm. as well. I have parents that tell me they're, they're only smoking marijuana. I said, well, you know, it's they're going to really learn and they're going to be able to really assess and see things from a different perspective when they're here and be able to also know the consequences. You know, they start seeing other people who come into treatment and have more severe issues. And they tell me, I never want to do that. I never want to be in their position. I never really. So it's really an eye opening experience for them to realize, you know, this could get bad because yeah. they could hear it from their parents, they could hear it from family members. But hearing it from someone who's exactly their age is very different. So I would encourage parents to really get educated on it, you know, get their education needed from professionals, you know, trying to get as much information as they can to make sure that they're doing the right decision for their family, for themselves, um, you know, to be able to know kind of maybe if they're not ready yet to kind of set a timeline of when this happens, we're definitely going to do this. So be able to really continue to be on top of that because if you already know that they're using it's only a matter of time before it could get worse. So it's really about being able to have a plan of action and know, okay, we know that if things get a little bit worse than they are now, we have a place mm -hmm. to go, we have a plan in place, this is happening. 
Um, so that's the biggest thing that I recommend. If you're not ready right now, have a plan for when you are um, and really make sure that you, know, you stay very present in your teen's life, be able to really know what they're up to, what they're doing, who they're talking to, um, and if they're using or not using, be really, you know, will be in the lookout for any mental health issues as well that could be um, part of, you know, part of their life at this point. Andrea Baskin, thank you so much for taking time to chat. I really appreciate your time. Um, I want to thank our audience for tuning in. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, do not hesitate to call and reach out and have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye.